Good morning, everybody. Tim Walsh, coming to you live from the University of Illinois Fire Service Institute. We're going to give you a minute to get signed in here, and then I'll be joined by Dr. Katie Tateris today. Uh, so go ahead and get signed in, and we'll get, be back with you in a minute. Good morning, everybody. Tim Walsh coming to you live from the Illinois Fire Service Institute on the campus of the University of Illinois. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Katie Tataris, who is the EMS Project Medical Director for the University of Chicago. Uh, she also has a background in public health, and she's a graduate here of uh, U of I. She started her career here with Illinois EMS as an EMT and has moved on to bigger and better things. So she was kind enough, kind enough to join us today to speak about EMS guidelines and public health guidelines as you respond to the COVID incident. Uh, please forward any questions or comments that you have to us right on the Facebook Live page. We'll be linking up stuff that the doctor's talking about so that you can refer to it as well. Let us know where you're watching from and please share this with other uh, people that are in your group so that we can get the message out. We've covered six parts of the pie uh, as it relates to the COVID-19 response. We feel this one is probably uh, as important as all the other ones that we've covered. But most of the stuff we're doing is EMS related and it's a public health issue, so remember we're supporting that role. So without any further hesitation, Dr. Tataris, please begin. All right, good morning everyone. So as Tim mentioned, my name is Dr. Katie Tataris. Um, I'm the EMS Medical Director for the Chicago EMS System in Region 11. Um, I'm also an attending physician at the University of Chicago Hospital and I work in the adult and pediatric emergency departments. Um, so part of my role there is an EMS Medical Director um, I really think public health and EMS education is very important. So as Tim mentioned, when he called, I was, you know, kind of jumped at the opportunity to come and talk to everyone here in Illinois about EMS and public health considerations for COVID. Um, I did get my start down here, and I feel like it's really part of our, our job to be good at education for our EMS providers um, as an EMS medical director. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, let me stand over here. So I want to start with a little bit of an overview on some COVID basics, just to make sure everyone's on the same page and kind of the same launching uh, area. So just to make sure everyone's aware, so the COVID virus is actually a severe acute respiratory syndrome virus called SARS. So it's actually part of the SARS family. Um, so it's the SARS coronavirus 2 is what the official name is. 
So that virus actually causes the infection. So the infection that someone gets is actually called COVID-19. Um, and again, that's caused by the SARS virus. So when you are infected by the virus, your incubation time from exposure to symptom onset is anywhere from zero to 14 days. Uh, most people show symptoms after day four or five, and the majority of people have symptoms around day 11. But that 14 days is your incubation time. So in terms of symptoms, there's a lot of symptoms that can be uh, suggestive of COVID-19. The most obvious ones that we hear about a lot is cough, fever, shortness of breath. But actually, you have to think about other viral syndrome causes, uh, symptoms that are present as, as part of COVID-19. So anyone with headache, congestion, sore throat, runny nose, chest pain, abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, uh, fatigue, feeling weak, decreased appetite, all of these things potentially could indicate COVID. Um, one of the things we've seen is that some patients just have GI or gastrointestinal syndrome symptoms. So patients with just nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea that actually are diagnosed to have COVID. So it's either those are just the primary symptoms or sometimes those are the initial symptoms before the respiratory uh, condition starts. We've also seen a fair number of uh, patients with a loss of smell or taste as the initial presenting symptom before the other symptoms I mentioned uh, start. Pediatric patients have a similar syndrome of uh, viral symptoms, primarily respiratory, uh, but it's been mostly minor uh, compared to the adult population that we're seeing. So in terms of the infection type, there's three types of infections you can have with COVID. There's either, you can either be asymptomatic and be kind of a carrier with the COVID uh, disease. You can also be pre-symptomatic, so it could be in your respiratory symptom, but you're not showing disease symptoms at that time. Uh, or you can actually be symptomatic with the COVID disease. So those are the three things. And that's why it's important to think about the incubation time, where you may actually have it infected in your system, but you may not be showing symptoms and you're spreading the virus out to the public. And we'll talk about that when we get to our public health concerns, because all of this, you know, basics is relevant when you think about, you know, what the impact it has in our community. So I'm gonna move over to the COVID, uh, the guidelines here in the middle. Um, so these are really mostly EMS considerations, all of our EMTs, paramedics, kind of first responders out there. When you're taking care of patients or even anyone in your community or your family with COVID, you have to think about all of these things. So we talked about the COVID virus can either be an acute respiratory syndrome um, or it can be a viral syndrome. So those are all things that could indicate a person has COVID-19. COVID-19 really can affect anyone, but someone, uh, there are certain populations that can have a more severe disease uh, compared to other populations. So populations that have higher risk of catching COVID or having a more severe disease uh, is anyone that's had close contact with a COVID positive person. So this is hard because we don't always know if patients have COVID or not. We're limited on our testing strategies, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But if you had known contact with someone who has COVID and you develop COVID type symptoms, that puts you at higher risk. So the second risk uh, we used to talk about a couple weeks ago was travel travel to an endemic area, travel somewhere where they had a lot of COVID patients. So that's kind of out the window now. A lot of patients that have COVID haven't traveled anywhere. So COVID is community spread. That means you can go to the grocery store, you can go to the gas station, and someone can cough on you and you can get COVID. So actually travel is not as much as a risk factor as, we, as it used to be because COVID is now community spread. Now travel still puts you at risk because if you're at a busy airport or a busy train station or on a bus doing public transportation, you're around a lot of people in close quarters. So that's still a risk factor, it's just not as much these days. Also where you travel from, there's a lot of travel restrictions now on international travel, but even local travel, New York, New Orleans, Seattle, um, Louisiana, place where there's a lot of uh, COVID infection now, those are more concerning for higher risk of catching the COVID infection. So another risk factor is living in close quarters. So as I mentioned, groups that are kind of very close to each other, they can't um, prevent the virus transmission as well. So some examples of this would be uh, the jail or incarcerated population, the homeless population, 
nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities that are all in very close quarters, uh, school dormitories, which are now mostly closed, um, and even firehouses. Anyone that's living in close quarters and very close you know, to each other is a little bit higher risk of catching the virus. So we just wanted to remind everybody, uh, Dr. Tataris is an expert in this field. She's dealing with patients every day in the emergency room at the University of Chicago. And we really want your input and we want your questions. So if there's something that you're not being asked to do or being asked to do in your current role, please feel free to submit that question to me via the comment section or text or email. You can email us at fsi-covid19questions at illinois.edu and we'll get you those answers while the doctor's here. So we appreciate your feedback and we appreciate your input. Sorry, Doc. Thanks, Jim. So a couple other high-risk groups I wanted to mention, healthcare workers, so you and I, frontline providers that are out seeing patients with COVID, responding to calls for patients with COVID, we're high risk because we are uh, exposed to these patients all the time. So this is extremely important for us to understand and remember. Um, anyone with a chronic medical condition is higher risk for catching a more severe disease. This is anyone with chronic heart disease, like hypertension, coronary artery disease, anyone with chronic lung disease, like asthma or COPD, anyone with chronic kidney disease, such as anyone on dialysis, those are much higher risk to catch a more severe infection. Additionally, diabetes is a big risk factor. Anyone whose age is over 60, again, has a lessened immune system response to be able to fight this disease. Um, and anyone who's immunocompromised, so anyone with HIV, anyone with chronic steroid use, anyone on immunosuppressive drugs, maybe a transplant person or anyone with a, a chronic disease on drugs to help reduce their immune response is higher risk. So we did have one question that somebody would like me to address, uh, right. Dr. Tataris. How are you protecting yourself and your family after your shift in the ER? What are you doing and what are you recommending the staff does at the end of their shift? That's a great question. So I'm a mom, I have three kids. Um, it's very hard going to work every day and taking care of COVID patients and then coming home to my family. So I think kind of understanding the disease transmission and kind of the science behind everything helps me feel, um, you know, okay with how I'm doing my routine every day. So personally, what I do is, you know, as soon as I'm done with my shift, immediately you kind of change your clothes. I wear scrubs at work, so I change from those scrubs to a clean pair of scrubs at the hospital. You know, you wipe down any shoes or other things like watches or badges that are in the environment and then leave them at work or leave them at the hospital. Um, then when you come home, you know, kind of do a good cleansing or if you have a shower at work, you can do that as well. But again, trying to maintain the work environment and the work uniform with the home environment and trying to prevent all transmission between the two areas. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, in terms of other things you can do at home, obviously if you have symptoms, the first thing to do is kind of quarantine yourself um, get tested if you're a healthcare worker. We'll talk about testing and indications later. Um, and then I try to stay apart from my family as much as possible. You know, that six feet, which is very difficult when you have little kids at home. Um, and a family to manage and a home work balance of it as well. So all of that is a consideration that I personally have and how I run my day to day. I hope that answered your question. So I'm gonna keep going unless there's any more questions. No, please keep going. All right. So I talked about age and immunocompromised status. That's the end of our high-risk conditions. So the next thing is, you know, someone was just kind of leading into protecting yourself, and that's what I talked about. So let's say you're working, you know, as an EMT or a paramedic, first responder out there, you, you get a call for someone with a cough. You know, in your head you're already thinking potentially they could have COVID. So as you're walking into that call, you have to think about how can I prepare myself when I'm going in? So the biggest thing is, you know, get that dispatch information, think about, you know, what's coming through. Maybe it's accurate, maybe it's less accurate, um, but think about COVID for anyone in this current time, anything you're responding to, the person could have infectious symptoms. And it's not just patients that are sick with fever and cough. You know, we've seen trauma patients that have come in, you know, that have had a runny nose for a couple of days and they have COVID. We have patients that are strokes that come in and they have a fever as well and they test positive for so really anyone that you come in contact with, whether it's a infectious dispatch or a non-infectious dispatch, protect yourself and you know, wear your proper uh, personal protective equipment. 
And this ties back to what we talked about in previous episodes that the doctor's speaking about now. We should be approaching patients uh, as if they have COVID every time. We should send in smaller crews to make a determination as to what the chief complaint of the patient is and then handle that chief complaint. But the person attending to the first patient should always be appropriately geared up in PPE. Our PPE donning and doffing guy will reference that again in the comments section so that you can see it. And please share that with police officers that you deal with and any volunteer organizations that are helping you on the street. I'm sorry to interrupt that. No, that's great. And I just want to kind of emphasize that what you said, any patient potentially could have COVID. So put a surgical mask on them as soon as you kind of make contact with them. You know, we recommend, as, as uh, Tim mentioned, that doorway assessment. So you're doing your scene size up, you're seeing what's going on. You walk in, you know, serve ma'am what's going on, put a mask on the patient as early as possible. That way you're preventing that source, uh, you're doing source control of whatever transmission of that patient, any respiratory droplets they have early on. And then kind of minimizing the, the providers that are responding, minimizing any exposure by wearing gear yourself uh, are the recommendations. So in terms of proper PPE, um, I know there's been some discussion on this, what is proper. In terms of anyone that potentially could have COVID, the very basic PPE recommendations are a surgical mask, gown, gloves, and some sort of eye protection. If you have personal glasses, you have to have something that covers the front and sides of your face to adequately protect you from that splash, uh, because that's what the droplets protection is for. So that's very important. We'll talk about kind of other things later, um, but that's kind of the minimum recommended PPE. The next thing I want to mention is transmission. And so this kind of lets us think about what type of PPE is needed for different circumstances. So the COVID virus is mostly a respiratory droplet transmission. So most of the time, the basic thing of what we need is a surgical mask to prevent that droplet transmission person to person. If you're doing any higher risk procedure, which is the next thing on the list, you wanna have an N95 or some sort of higher level respirator to prevent that aerosol generating transmission from the virus. So that's the next thing I wanna talk about. You have to think about what type of, of how the virus is transmitted to how to protect yourself for the environment. So aerosol generating procedure, I think is a fairly self-explanatory concept, but it's basically you're doing something that is stimulating the virus to be you know, sent into the atmosphere. So things that are considered aerosol generating procedures um, is using a bag valve mask, suctioning a patient, a nebulizer treatment, using CPAP, intubation, and CPR. Those are the big ones. Uh, so these are things that EMS providers want to minimize if there's a suspicion of COVID, because otherwise you're aerosolizing that virus to the environment. So obviously in the back of the ambulance, or if you're kind of in an enclosed space and you have a nebulizer going, all of that virus is going all over the walls, your patient care uh, equipment, you, your everything you're wearing. So we really want to minimize these procedures for the most severe patients. And I think it's very difficult to say, you know, who needs a nebulizer and who doesn't need a nebulizer. Um, you know, we really recommend them only for patients that are very critical. Um, and really ones that are wheezing are the ones that makes a difference. Um, really the first line treatment for anyone with COVID and respiratory distress is just starting on nasal cannula oxygen and kind of supporting the respiratory drive that way. Most patients do fine with a couple liters of nasal cannula. And the benefit of this is you can put a surgical face mask over that to help prevent the droplets as well as supporting their oxygenation. So that's really the first line treatment for respiratory support. Uh, the COVID patient, we talked about usually you're getting respiratory symptoms um, with a viral pneumonia or other respiratory complaints. So this actually is a lot of, uh, will help most of these patients as the first line uh, treatment. Now let's say you have an asthmatic or someone with COPD that's short of breath and has a cough and fever. So these are patients that are going to be wheezing, they're going to be more having more respiratory distress, they potentially will need an intervention in a pre-hospital setting. So again, for these patients, you want to try to minimize your nebulizer as much as possible, start with the nasal cannula, see if that oxygenation helps, and then think about your adjuncts for patients with wheezing or bronchial constriction and potentially COVID. So instead of albuterol, albuterol through the nebulizer, you can give a meter dose inhaler uh, to prevent aerosolation for these patients. So if the patient has a albuterol MDI at home, you 
and give it to them or bring it with them to the hospital. A lot of hospitals are in short supply of albuterol MDIs because we're using them in the hospital as well. Uh, if you're a higher level provider, you can use magnesium, helps with bronchoconstriction, and also epinephrine IM helps with severe bronchoconstriction. So think about your adjuncts or other things you can use for respiratory distress that these patients may benefit from besides just giving them a nebulizer. Uh, also, I'm sorry, Doug. So we had another question about the email address. I just wanted to cover that one more time for you guys. It's FSI hyphen COVID-19 questions at illinois.edu. And as the doctor was talking about the nebulizer treatments, if we can, and the weather is cooperating, let's give those on the outside of the ambulance, preferably in fresh air, and then let's treat that as a hazmat situation. You guys want to be standing upwind, minimal manpower when that's occurring, if it has to be done, if you're communicating with medical control and that's what they want you to do. Be smart about this. Treat every patient just as a hazmat patient. Make sure that you're PPE up and that you're upwind and uphill when you're treating those patients and you're using a high risk treatment category. Exactly. The last comment I want to make about treatment of COVID patients is regarding cardiac arrest. So cardiac arrest is a high risk scenario. So any cardiac arrest patient should go in with full PPE including your N95. And we're still treating these patients with our normal cardiac arrest protocols with a few uh, considerations. So because we know that bag valve mass and suction are higher risk, we want our BVM to have a viral filter on them. This will help decrease virus transmission. Since we know intubation is high risk, we want to use a superglottic airway or something you can easily place blindly and not need a direct laryngoscopy view of that airway. So superglottic is over intubation for these patients. Uh, additionally, we know that um, since bagging is higher risk, potentially doing that superglottic early and maybe starting with compressions, getting the rhythm, putting the superglottic in, and maybe forgetting bagging altogether for these patients. So those are considerations to think about for cardiac arrest. Most systems are still using the regular cardiac arrest protocols in terms of working patients in the field. Um, you know, clearly everyone's reconsidering everything with the amount of patients we're seeing with COVID. Uh, but currently in terms of the EMS arena, um, we're still managing these patients for resuscitation. So, unless there's any other questions on treatment from anyone, I'm going to move on to public health considerations. All right, so there's a lot of topics here, but I think also very relevant to what we learned previously about COVID. So the first thing is testing. So, testing has been expanded quite a bit recently, which is good. Initially, testing was from a nasal swab that would have a couple day turnaround, and this really inhibited our uh, ability to tell patients if they had the disease until a delayed process. So some systems still have a couple day turnaround with their testing, so most patients are sent home or admitted without knowing their COVID status until a couple days later, which means if you're the EMS provider that brought them in, you may not know if that patient was positive until up to a week later because that's how long it takes for us to get this notification back. The good news is our testing has actually improved recently. They are testing some point of care testing, which is not a nasal swab, it's a blood test to look for antibodies. So this is allowing increased testing capability for some of these patients to help with our uh, quarantine and infection control procedures. So there is some limitation to testing. Not every test is perfect. Um, when you want to test someone that is high risk for having COVID. So that means you have to have symptoms uh, to be tested because you can have a false negative if you're tested without symptoms. You have to usually have some sort of high risk condition. So the ones I mentioned before here, having diabetes, having COPD, being on dialysis, those are high risk patients that would benefit from testing because you might treat them differently if they have this severe viral infection. The last category we test is us, the healthcare workers, because we need to know if it's safe for us to go back to work and continue our job if we have COVID or not. So those are kind of the three categories that testing is prioritized for. Um, hopefully in the future we'll be expanding testing, but that's how we're, uh, most places that do testing are looking at their uh, testing indications. So infection control. So this is something that, you know, us as health provi healthcare providers, we have to really care about. Someone asked before how I do my infection control when I go home. This is at work too. So in between patients, 
in between you know, eating, in between going to the bathroom, all this stuff is super important in terms of good hand washing, right? 20 seconds of good hand washing with every time you, you do that, don't touch your face. Anytime you have symptoms, coughing, sneezing, anything, you should stay home, quarantine yourself, or get tested for COVID and see if you actually have the virus um, to know if you need to be quarantined longer. So infection control is super important, uh, which leads me into public health. So we all should know this stuff very well because our family is going to ask us, the public is going to ask us, they're going to look to us as people that know what's going on and are kind of in to know about these healthcare situations. All of this stuff I talked about, they're going to come to you and ask questions. So it's up to us to know good information and the science behind it to know, to give the information out there to people that may not know or may have not have the right information. So I think that's up to us as healthcare workers to be really cognizant of that. So, Public health measures that um, you know different governors or mayors have put into place recently. This stay-at-home messaging is critically important. And why is that? I mentioned you could be asymptomatic and still have the virus. You could be pre-symptomatic and be infected but not know you have it yet. Or you could be symptomatic and still go out in public and give it to everyone. So every time you go out, you know whether it's to get groceries or to do something else your potential for catching the virus. So that social distancing and staying at home is super important for the asymptomatic carriers and just to keep ourselves healthy. So these public health measures have been fairly aggressive here in Illinois and hopefully they will work because we are seeing our curve go up in terms of our number of cases and our number of deaths, which is actually very scary to listen to. So these measures that they are uh, advocating is to control the disease are very important for us to understand and to let our family and friends know the importance of that. So then that brings me down to the next concept. So we're seeing a lot of patients with COVID in Chicago. Most counties in Illinois have someone that's tested positive, but I think not all of them yet because there's limitations in testing. So I think once testing expands, it will be in your community as much as it is in my community because I have a lot of patients that have COVID already. And we're already looking at places like New York that have, are being overwhelmed with patients with COVID. How do we triage them? How do we take care of the sickest and leave the ones that are not sick at home to prevent the disease transmission? So that's kind of the next thing on here. So we have to look at patients with severe disease, the ones that have you know, risk factors or vital sign abnormalities or severe symptoms. These are the ones that need medical care. These are the ones that hopefully are calling us for an emergency evaluation and they need to go to the doctor because they can't manage at home anymore. The minor symptoms, you know, the public health messaging is stay at home, self-quarantine yourself, even if you do or don't have it, because you don't want to pass that virus to anyone. So we're hoping that once they get sick, and we've seen this in Chicago, we get the sicker ones are calling us. We're not getting flu and fever calling us, we're getting shortness of breath, we're getting syncope, we're getting altered mental status. These are the patients calling 911 now because they've been at home for two weeks or a week with their symptoms, and they can't take it anymore. So it is up to us to take care of them, but we do want that minor population to stay at home of the minor symptoms. And that kind of feeds into resource allocation. So, you know, there's a finite number of ambulances, a finite number of hospital beds, a finite number of ICU beds. If we fill up and we're at capacity, we can't treat everyone. So we really have to make sure that we're giving the resources to the ones that need it and try to manage our, our public health system that way. So this is not just for you know, us in EMS, it's public safety, it's everything. This is the public safety of everyone at large. So we are doing population-based care, we are not doing individual care anymore. We are looking for the safety of the community, the safety of our, our public, the safety of everyone with us. So staying home, calling 911 when you need it, and us trying to minim minimize disease transmission by keeping patients at home that are not so as healthcare providers, I mentioned that, you know, we really have to trust our source of information. I know the portal has some really good resources from the local health departments. Uh, for us, it's the Chicago Department of Public Health, but other local health departments, the Illinois Department of Public Health, uh, Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, are all good websites for COVID-related uh, information. I would just make sure that if you're actually quoting a source or saying, hey, I read something on social media, you actually look at who posted it because there's a lot of bad information out there and I want all of our healthcare providers to know 
you know, the right message and what is truth versus what is fake news. Excuse me, Doc. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the stress that normal people are feeling about whether they should be tested or should not be tested again? Yeah. We've had some questions about it, and I know that you're getting a lot of phone calls in the ER about it. Yeah. So it's a huge topic, both in the state of Illinois and nationally. Could you speak about that for a few minutes, please? Yeah, so I want to go back to the illness severity. So remember that 80% of the patients are going to have mild infection. And we're only testing ones that are have comorbidities or have health, or are healthcare providers. So we have a lot of people out there that are worried, do they have COVID, do they not have COVID, are they going to get sick and die? There's a lot of anxiety about there about this disease, and that's expected because we can't test everyone. And we have different types of illness severities. We have patients that just have a sore throat and a cough, and then we have ones that have worsening shortness of breath, they're becoming hypoxic, they're beginning, you know, needing to be intubated. That's very scary for people to think that they could progress, progress into a more severe disease state. So I think the biggest thing to remember is, you know, monitor your symptoms, emergency symptoms for people to understand, and it's important for us to let the public know if you have worsening shortness of breath, especially with activity, worsening chest pain or pressure, if you start to have bluish, you know, cyanosis um, showing up around your lips, or if you're more confused or altered, those are signs you may have a severe illness. Other than that, if you have minor symptoms, cough, runny nose, shortness of breath, um, really it's uh, recommended to stay at home and you don't really qualify for testing at this point, which, you know, is understandably provoking anxiety. So we had one other question just come in, Doc, about high-risk procedures, about how long do you think that the high-risk procedures that you talked about earlier, the way that we treat those now, uh, will continue to go on until we go back to the way that we used to deliver treatment in the field? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. So with this whole curve flattening, you know, what we're trying to do is kind of decrease the amount of people with COVID, but that means we're spreading the disease out to a longer time frame. So you'll see that a lot of the um, closing of things, whether it's local or at the state level, has been extended now through the end of April. So it's your guess as good as mine as how long this is gonna last for. Hopefully it'll be done by the summer, but you know, it's a pandemic, it could get worse, I have no idea. So it's, this is the message for now, keep doing this, and then fingers crossed it's working, and we can go back to you know life as we used to know, but I mean, everything's changed now, right? So everything that we are doing in terms of our social situation is different, our emergency medical care is different, our, you know, how we're dealing with our home situation is different. Everything is different now, so we have to remember that. And I would just say keep everything up until you hear otherwise. And I wait till the experts to tell me something. So even my EMS system and what I tell my people, I wait until CDC changes their official recommendation because I wanted to come from the top, and that's who I use as my source. So the last thing I want to talk about here is wellness. And it's not last because it's the least important. It's the last because I think I want to make sure I end on a good note. So we have a stressful job. We are first responders, we're boots on the ground, we're frontline providers. So in this time of COVID, which is a global pandemic, we have potential coworkers with the disease. We see people you know, on the news dying from the disease. This is scary and it's hard to be responding to this and being in that person's house and trying to help them when you're worried yourself that you may catch it and bring it home to your family. So that's completely understandable and you have to realize that your wellness is important too. So taking care of yourself at home, staying hydrated, sleeping, doing things for your mental health, physical activity are very important, eating well. It's very easy to get wrapped up in this whole situation and go into a Google spiral where you're reading all this stuff and you're very scared but we have to keep a level head in this and realize that there are experts out there telling us the right things to do, and we have to bring this to our public and to our families and to our communities uh, to pass along the good messaging. Doc, we had one other question come in from families that you and I are both familiar with, where maybe the wife is an ER nurse mm -hmm. and the husband is a paramedic or a police officer. Mm -hmm. They have young children in the family, and they're both working opposite shifts. Are there any recommendations that you could make what they would do if they started to see signs and symptoms in their home, how to treat that, how to, how to get tested. I know that the testing facility on Forest Preserve Drive is open again today. I'll get you that address in a minute in Harvard Heights for healthcare professionals, but is there anything that you would recommend as a physician to 
try to address that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's challenging, I will say that at least. So the biggest thing is, if you have symptoms, get tested, because then you know if you need to quarantine or not. So there are some options for you know healthcare workers, first responders to go and get testing, so that would be the priority. And then a lot of times we minimize our symptoms or don't take it seriously. If you're not feeling well, you gotta go in. and Just don't sit at home and wait until you're you know too sick you know, this is something that we, you know, I could never get sick, I'm invincible, that type of thing. You know, this virus really can attack anyone, so if you are feeling worse uh, and you need to go in for evaluation, that's what you need to do. So that's how you take care of yourself and your family and your community. Um, and then in terms of a dual, you know, healthcare provider family, ask for help as much as possible. Some of my colleagues have kind of sent their kids away or going to live in you know, a hotel or an apartment for the next month or two because they don't want to infect their family. Again, some of those kind of higher, um, you know, those are very difficult decisions to make when you're part of a family unit, but you know, it's, it's a very difficult time. Things are, are not what they used to be, so I think a lot of people are making these decisions for their family. Yeah, I, I think that we've talked about this before, but we want to reiterate it again. When Danielle's chief fellow spoke the other day, he talked about EOC supporting hospitals and first responders across the state of Illinois. And I know that they're trying to do that. I know in Chicago, the mayor has secured some hotel rooms for first responders. I know that a hotel nearby to the University of Chicago is providing rooms for physicians and nurses that don't want to infect their family, that feel that they've been exposed. So we would recommend to other agencies in the state, EOCs uh, that are operating under this condition, to try to support the people and communicate with those people that are out there on the front lines so that we can attack this together, not singularly. Um, is there anything else that you want to cover today, Doc? Uh, let me see if there's some other questions, which I believe there is. I just got to get off camera to get it for you. Okay. One thing I want to add is that kind of social uh, importance. So if you you know, reach out to someone that's dealing with this too because it's sometimes nice to get a call or a text from someone that's dealing with the same stuff you are. And having that support system from another healthcare provider is super important. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that a lot of our patients may not be receiving their chronic medical care uh, because their clinics are closed or because, you know, their doctor is not able to take care of them. So we're seeing a lot of these patients that, you know, maybe unable to access health care because they can't get their diabetes medication filled or their clinic is closed or some reason. So trying to connect these patients with other community resources or you know telehealth services in this time where most clinics are closed or have alternate structures is really important to maintain public health as well. We also had a, a couple of other questions come in with they would like to cover high risk procedures one more time okay. in, a little, in a little bit more detail. And then we had a comment, I'm sorry guys I gotta look at it from Eric West that there is a testing site now in Bloomington, Illinois. They're testing about 100 healthcare professionals a day. And uh, we'll get that address for you as soon as we can. And if I can't post it during the live feed, I'll post it uh, in the comments section or during a minute message later today. Eric, thanks for that help. Actually, it might be good to have kind of the testing site centralized. I know each day it seems like there's another testing site with you know hours and locations. So that may be something that uh, a portal could do is kind of have the testing sites, especially the first responders throughout the state. Um, what specifically about high-risk procedures with the question? They would like you to just cover them in a little more detail again, just one more time, because okay. uh, uh, you and I have a tendency to talk fast, I know that sure. I do, so if you would kind of go into those high-risk procedures again, okay. just in a little bit more detail and talk about your concerns as it relates to EMS on the street. All right, so just the first thing I want everyone to remember is that COVID is a respiratory virus. So it is in, the virus lives in the secretions in our respiratory tract. So anytime someone has an infection, especially if they're showing symptoms, cough, fever, shortness of breath, and we stimulate those aerosols, we stimulate the secretions to come out of their mouth, anyone that touches them is at risk of catching the virus. So things that stimulate uh, virus transmission and the cough and the secretions um, are things like bag valve mass because again you're kind of pushing air into their upper respiratory tract and having that those secretions um, come out. So that can be minimized with a viral filter or a HEPA filter um, because it helps with the disease transmission between the patients and the oxygen delivery device. 
the second thing is a suction. So anytime you have someone with a lot of secretions in their mouth, they're trying to you know, open their airway, secure their airway, that suction device actually kind of sprays the secretions everywhere. So that should be minimized as much as possible. The third thing is a nebulizer treatment. This is actually one of the highest risk things because you have a, a aerosol uh, generating device kind of spreading the medication everywhere as well as whatever's in that patient's mouth uh, spreading it as well. There's a couple of things to minimize virus transmission that decrease the risk um, that are kind of products in the market or different devices that I've seen other vendors um, kind of advertise. But in general, anytime you're doing this, it's higher risk. So if the patient can make it to the hospital, again, depending on your transport times, I know that might not be possible. So just decreasing the risk of transmission as much as you can in the pre-hospital uh, arena. Um, the next thing is a CPAP device, so any kind of a non-invasive positive pressure device that you're kind of forcing air into the patient's upper airway to prevent you know, respiratory collapse. Again, you're kind of pressing a high flow air generation into that patient's airway, potentially having the virus transmitted because of that. So if a patient can tolerate a non-breather or just a nasal cannula instead of needing that non-invasive support, so that's preferred for these patients. Um, intubation is obviously very high risk because you are right in the first in your patient's you know, upper airway trying to visualize the um, you know, vocal cord. So for someone that may be COVID or you know, in our system, we basically said no intubation at all until this dies down because I don't want to put people at risk for getting the virus. So uh, superglottic airway, eye gel, king airway are preferred uh, to intubation during this time. And the last thing is doing CPR. Obviously, if you have someone that needs resuscitation, CPR is required for someone that's critical. So do it with good PPE, do it with red 95, gown, gloves, mask to protect yourself while doing these procedures. So remember, we are first responders, we are called to save people and to do these things, so we have to know that we protect ourselves and the need to go in and do them. I hope that helps. No, it's been, it's been awesome. It's been a great uh, series, and we want to talk to you about what we've covered this far that you can share with your companies and with your people on drill night or just drill in the firehouse. So we've covered six subject areas as it relates to the COVID-19 response for first responders across the state. We talked about chief officer responsibilities. We talked about first responder uh, responsibilities and procedures. We talked about PPE and DCOM. We talked about overview documents and how to integrate the Emergency Operations Center and other agencies in supporting public health, the hospitals and first responders across the state. We talked about resiliency uh, for both uh, EMS responders, fire service and law enforcement with those links on our portal page. And then today, Dr. Tataris talked about EMS and public health. We feel that we've divided the pie up into six equal portions, and we've given you a way to go, but we're not gonna leave you there. We'll be back with you with minute messages and updates as it relates to the COVID-19 response. But as Dr. Tataris said, we get our information from the CDC and IDPH as well. And that's where we're linking to you most of the time. If there are updates in the way CDC and IDPH are responding to this, as it relates to first responders in the state, we'll update you. We're gonna be transitioning over the next week into some live training, some other topics, but we also want your input. If you feel that there's something that we haven't covered in this six part series, something that you wanna see, hit us up on the email again at fsi.covid19questions at illinois.edu. And even if it's not a COVID-19 question, if there's some training that you wanna see us perform, here on the Facebook forum, please get it to us and we'll get it for you. We wanna thank you for tuning in with us today. Please make sure you share this with your companies and your departments across the state. We wanna thank everybody for watching. Stay safe and continue to support each other on the street, support the hospitals and the nurses and the physicians that are supporting you and every other agency that's in this fight. I'd also like to thank Dr. Tataris from the University of Chicago for driving all the way down here to go live with us today. Take care of each other on the street, and we'll see you again next week.